What makes the person want to run 150 miles? These people, they come out here, they torture themselves. They're pushing themselves to their physical limits, running marathons back to back to back here in this heat. What about approaching those limits helps them reach what's torn inside of them? And then as they're out here and they're finding where they're broken, can the desert, this fiery, vast expanse, can it fix them? I hear a lot of times that, you know, I'm just hard-nosed. I just like to see people suffer. I am Reed, I'm the race director. My job at this race is to create the hardest race possible. Bring in the heat, bring in the altitude, bring in the elevation changes, bring in the mileage, make it so incredibly difficult. Suffering is a, is a good thing. It makes you feel alive. It brings you to that center of who you are and what you're capable of. If you don't suffer, you will never know what you're capable of. I am Kyla Cladell. I am the racer liaison for the Deseret Stage Race. I'm out there on the course making sure that everybody is safe. And when they get into camp and they're upset that the day was so difficult, way tougher than they expected, that's what Kyla does. She deals with, with their moves. She deals with getting them all settled down. I'm not afraid that, that people are going to get upset. They're going to. Desert Rest is a 150 mile race from Fruita, Colorado to Moab, Utah. It takes place over five stages through the desert in the summer. This race is the desert and there is a magic in the desert, truly. It's like when there's a movie and New York is a character. The main character of this story is the Cocopelli. It's this trail. Some of the harshest and most beautiful conditions on the planet. It will be in your soul by the time this is over, and you'll be so much better for it. So we are looking at past year's expedition yes. journals. Renee. This was a huge year. Hiding underneath the, uh, underneath the rock, the only rock in that whole area. And that first day, everybody gets hit hard. Everybody thinks they did heat training, and then they get out there, and it's just way worse than, than they imagine. Running in the desert, if it, was, if it was cool, would be like climbing Everest if it wasn't so high. Why did you do these journals? Uh, so the journals were just so that we could keep track of everybody out there. And if we had to go find a body out there, we would say, okay, it's the body laying there with the journal in their pocket. A good cop and bad cop both love those. Mo That's why we're there. It is an unbelievable feeling to have your place in the world be make people watch people achieve impossible things. My job is to make you suffer. I have brought in the heat. I have brought in the elevation. The aid stations are spread out. This Desert Rats will be my third, my third Desert Rats. I have completely detonated and hit the wall hard in races that have been hot in the past. And so I'm terrified of the heat. Well, I'm the big sister. She's a little sister in our family. They call me boss baby. I don't know what we call I'm you. I'm just the peacemaker. Yeah, she definitely is. Also, I'll say, and when you run the trails, you feel like badass. And so, like, this is a chance for us to do stuff that people are like, what? Feeling good. Good crew. Just get ready to embark on this, uh, on this journey together. It's good. It was funny, like, five miles out, we were all chit-chatting and stuff like that, having a good time. And then as soon as we realized we were approaching our starting point, it got real quiet. I'm a dad, and I work to support my kids, and in my off time, I like to run. My wife and I and my family, we partook in a half marathon up in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Year after year after year, I ended up doing this race 10 times. Running is often identified as like a very singular, individual thing, and that weekend was all about us as a family. Then, in my life, something I could have never fathomed happened and everything I had been working for was gone. I felt like I could no longer show up as Phil Pinty. I just started showing up to races as the Macho Man. Now here is this, this uniform almost, this armor that I could wear, and I didn't have to be Phil Pinty. I could be the Macho Man. The Macho Man could show up. 
it almost seemed like every race that I did, it got bigger and bigger and more flamboyant. People who dressed like that wouldn't feel spectacular and, you know, larger than life. So in a sense, I had like two personas, right? Like when I was at home, I was Phil Pinty, I was dad. And then when I was running races, I was the macho man. The racers, they're thrown into this situation where they're suffering together with people they've never even met before. You haven't met anyone, but you know there are all these lone, long distance runners who share one thing that you share with them. So I have a military background. Almost every race that I'm in, I carry a flag with me. I'm surrounded by amazing athletes. I'm doubting, did I do enough? Did I put in enough work? Did I train enough? Because I haven't competed at a super high level in a race like this before. Stage one is a Salt Creek stage and it's 20 miles. It's open desert. It's tough because people are introduced to the heat. It's really interesting to see the new racers every year. There are those looking to win, the ones that just want to survive, the runners, the walkers, the solitary seekers, and the social animals. Everyone brings a different strategy to somehow cope with this impossible task before them. It's tortoise and the hare stuff initially, but pretty quickly you realize it's about something much more, and that's, you know, the story each person brings. I've never done anything like this. I mean, part of the reason I signed up for this race is because I wanted to experience what it was gonna be like racing back-to-back -back days. It's kind of terrifying in a lot of ways. When I think about a stage race and I think about what this is gonna demand, not only in terms of heat, but also just in terms of the day in, day out, getting up and getting it done, it's gonna be a journey. Only three miles into this thing. It's definitely getting hot. I'm already tired. No idea how I'm gonna finish the rest of the week. My parents went with, what's everyone calling their children? Amy, what's no one calling their children? <laughs> Michael Lynn. We don't live very close together. We've had a lot of time apart and we were really close growing up. Like I wouldn't even go outside and play if she wouldn't go with me. Or she would get babysitting jobs and I would go babysitting. And, and she'd give me half the money. the money. So yeah, so I was boss baby peacemaker. I only took a few wrong turns. That's okay though. We didn't go too far down the wrong path. Wait, babushka. She has a long history of sucking me into things that she thinks that would be fun. Growing up, Amy always had it together. And uh, I didn't like her at times, you know, you're very jealous. She always had the, the right answers. Everything was competition. Cleaning the house was a competition. How many flips can you do on the trampoline? Any sport, anything we did with my dad, volleyball, basketball, softball. We would race on roller skates skateboards, we'd race our bikes. She's prettier than me, she's faster than me, she's better at softball than me. My dad loves her more than me. I am faster than her. She's tougher. Mentally, she is. I tell you what, she, she can handle pain. Everybody needs to be that hero. Everybody needs to be able to dig deep. Everybody needs to be able to break out of their comfort zone. So I started running in September of 2019. So I've done these distances before, but never like back to back. I'm really excited for it. It'll be the hottest too, by far. By far the hottest. <laughs> I'll go swimming. I lived out in Colorado for a while and out in Utah. Got my commercial helicopter license in Utah and was just uh, climbing and having a good time working menial jobs, waitress, ice cream scooping, at Smart. I was a ski instructor, raft guide, EMT. 
And now I'm with the Navy. That was the hardest thing in the entire world. I was like, every couple feet, I'd be like, go like five steps and I'd like sit down and cry. Yeah, I'm really, really worried about tomorrow. Though. I'm first a dad, you know, husband, father, uh, five kids. The youngest just graduated from high school. Um, turned uh, 50 this year. So I did one tour in Iraq. Got home in 2005, got out of the military in 2006, and then pretty much just kind of wandered a little bit, you know. I found myself for personally really kind of getting angry a lot more often. My wife saw that, hey, something's not right. And when I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, and so I started running just out on my own to try to help. I mean, it got to the point where if I was having a bad day, my wife would say, hey, do you need to go for a run? 6'6", 250 pounds. Not usually what I see when, you know, when I go to the starting line and I look around, uh, I guess the, the way I would describe it is most runners are more like a gazelle and I'm more of a Clydesdale. The interesting thing happens when you carry the flag. It's hard not to stand up a little bit straighter and move a little bit faster. It's not about you anymore. I think that's really where it comes from. It's about something bigger, that idea of what we can be. It was tough because I had been to Iraq. I'd done these crazy things in Iraq. And then I came home. I have a, a group of four friends that I run with. And over the course of a couple of years, we had run a lot of miles together. And also at that time, I would, had been struggling with post-traumatic stress. Part of that healing process was getting out with these friends. For some reason, when we were gonna go on a run, if somebody didn't show up, you got a, a message from them saying, hey, where were you? We missed you. And the reality is these people saved my life. So I started building flags to show them how grateful I was. We had an old cedar fence that had been taken down and was literally just leaning against the house. So I took that wood, took it apart, pulled the nails out one at a time, and used that wood to make flags for these friends. Because in my mind, I was this old used up thing that had experienced this brand new life because these friends you were worried about me and, and were concerned and made sure that I got up and, and was moving and taking care of myself. When I go to the lumber store, I'm not looking for the nicest pieces. I'm looking for the stuff that, that maybe is a little bit twisted. Or I'm, as I'm driving down the street, if I see a couple of boards sticking out of somebody's trash, I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if I could use that. It's just amazing to see this, you know, old used up piece of wood kind of go from that to suddenly really this beautiful flag. To me, the flag represents what we can be, not what we are, because we're not perfect, but what we can be. That it should represent every person, every American, every person that comes to this country should be able to look to the flag and know that they are someplace safe. The flag is really important to me. I have, you know, stood on the tarmac in Iraq as the coffins of four soldiers were carried onto an airplane and their coffins were covered in the flag. So when I'm making a flag, it's hard not to think about those things. I think everyone coming into this race at the start of it has the reason why they're here. And on Saturday when this thing wraps up, for many folks, it's not gonna be the same thing. And that thing that they leave with, they don't even know what that thing is yet. They'll find it this week. Day two is the milk stage and it's 40 miles. They're expecting heat, but they have no idea how hot it's gonna get. I watch people suffer and that's okay because I know it's on, on the other side for them. I've seen it so many times. I know it's on the other side. Tuesday's the great equalizer, baby. For no one else but for you, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth because Tuesday's coming for you whether you like it or not.
I didn't go into this thinking, you know, oh, I'm so fast. <laughs> you know, I recognize I am not the fastest guy out there. I will always be at the end. I have won one medal in a race, and that was for third place because there was only three of us. What's in the bag? It's a hard thing. A book. It's on Thoreau, Henry Thoreau. I like to read, I love to read. It's my way of engaging the mind and it's my way of having a different experience or different entry into the same terrain or people exploring nature in a way that may teach me how I might want to change some of the things in my life. We promoted the let's go back to nature. We don't need all those perks that everyone is chasing after. We just need to run 150 miles, right? It's certainly a little crazy when you have to carry everything for miles and miles in not so friendly terrains to carry that extra book. In ultra running, we always talk about the pain cave. And you go into the pain cave and you come out stronger from the pain cave. And it seems really kind of masochistic to want to know what that's like, but I guess I kind of do. I want to prove to myself that I'm strong enough to get out of it. The heat out there is more intense than most people have ever even experienced in their lives. People suffer hard. Oh yeah, that heat was unforgettable. This blows, it's hotter. Fuck you. The air's hot, the water that you're drinking's hot. Everything that you have is hot. The heat, the open desert out there, and the isolation and stuff, like that, that can really catch up and just really wear you down and make you feel vulnerable and helpless. The heat in the desert, when it's really bad, it's surreal. You kind of can't believe it's happening and you keep asking yourself, am I this hot? Can I keep breathing? Can I keep moving? Can I handle this? But when it's 110 degrees, now they're panicked. Like, I'm going to die. We had felt hot weather before, but just, just nothing like that. It just got, as the day progressed, it just got hotter and hotter. hiking up there, we're doing good. Amy's kind of lagging behind, and she's like, just go on, just go on. You know, I'm not feeling the best. I was pretty discouraged and tired, and you know, these salt tablets that you could chew, in with salt tablets that you swallow with water. And the pill went down my throat, dry, and just stuck. And then I realized, I, I, I cannot breathe. I had decided to go up ahead, and a guy came up, and said that blonde girl was choking. Instantly, I'm like, oh my god, that's my, that's my sister. It felt like I swallowed like tiny nails that were like clawing at my, you know, scratching my throat. So I just flooded my mouth with water and kept trying to throw up. And somebody came by and hit me on the back. And then I started to be able to cough. They came running in and said a woman down the trail is choking. I heimlicked her. Yeah, and what? This fear comes over you because you're like, oh my God, what you got to do? You know, that's my that's my sister, you know. And all of a sudden, it's like, you know, maybe I should run down there. And then, then Kyla's like, oh, she's breathing, she's okay. It was just relentless, and it was just hard to breathe. It was hard to think. I emotionally was just done. And I could hear the aid station. So, but I just, I, I, I couldn't breathe. I cried for two miles because they said my sister wasn't breathing. Oh, she's choking off me. She's breathing now. She's good. Those low moments can be really low because five miles might not seem like a long time to get to the aid station, 
or to the finish line or whatever, but it can seem impossibly far. When you're out in the elements and it's 100 plus degrees outside, it truly becomes about survival. And you have to set the competition aside enough to make sure that your brothers and sisters that you're out here with, all the other desert rats are okay. Came across Mike who was sitting in third place. He was just suffering. And at that point, it wasn't about first place or third place or last place. It was about, let's get through this together. It was so hot. I mean, it was so hot. It became a mission in survival, and I was just there to help Mike. I wasn't internally focused anymore on winning another stage. I was like, let's get this done. So there's this thing in racing, I, I guess in life when you're competing and the metric you use for success is how well you're doing against the next guy. And you see that guy, Mike in this case, I mean, Mike's this badass who's run all of these stage races all over the world. And I realized at that aid station, like we've been running neck and neck all day. And then I see him just decimated. And I'm like, oh my God, he's done. But this switch goes off and I can't even explain it. This competitive thing just goes away. And all I saw was him suffering. And this deep impulse in me is like, this guy needs me. Like we have to get going again. What company can do, encouragement can do, it's, it's everything out here. And suddenly it's this beautiful thing. It's not me versus him anymore at that point. It's us versus the desert. And that's what makes this race more beautiful than almost any other race I've been to. Easily the most rewarding finish of my life. All that pressure of winning and performance, it was just gone. We did it together, me and him. We beat the desert together, at least for one day. I didn't plan on this portion of my life, going to races, dressing up like this professional wrestler, but it helped me through this period. Fairly early in life, my wife Jen and I thought that we had everything. The world was our oyster, like everything was really going great. A little daughter that's four, a son that's two. 33 years of age, we got devastating news that my wife was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. I don't know what was going through Jen's head, but I know for me, I, I, couldn't, even, I couldn't even wrap my head around that. We were listening to everything the doctors were saying and we were willing participants, but we didn't want to comprehend. We didn't want to understand what they were saying because we, that's just not the way life is supposed to go. So we never spoke end of life. We never spoke about death and we never spoke about what the other side would look like for the kids and I. Post diagnosis, we only had six months to spend together. You just want to climb into a hole and die. You know, you don't want to keep on living and keep on going. You know, we went into that thing together, and now I'm doing it alone. And I think in, in the months that followed after losing her, I didn't know how, how the kids and I were going to get through it. It kind of became this cathartic thing where Phil could be hurting, like, on the inside. But when I was running, it was just about being carefree and, like, enjoying myself. Is Mikey still with you? I don't know. She, um, she was moving pretty slow. Mikey and the big guy, I don't know. She was loopy. She was basically saying, I want to go to sleep. And I was like, dear, get up. And I'm starting to feel a little bit nauseous. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I can push through this. You know, just a little upset stomach. Push through this. Start on the road, and I just feel myself. And I'm just like, Ugh. So I'm like barfing up everything that I, I think I had in my whole entire body. She laid down under the railroad bridge for maybe half an hour. And and she got up and kept going. This girl is the toughest girl you'll ever meet. She's been through tons of shit in her life, yeah. and she just keeps on going. And so I just know how tough she is. But I was like also 
she's the kind of person who dies because she doesn't know that you should stop. So they saw Reed. Okay. And he's, so he's running around trying to get cell reception. Oh. Hello. She's four miles Wait, hold from on. the aid station. She's four miles. She yeah. can't make it? I oh, should have made her quit. So damn stubborn. No. No. <laughs> I know. In these races, you, you got to know your your body. You know, you always worry about your kidneys or or something like that shutting down. And I'm just like, okay, can I go on? Can I go on? Made it 0.7 of a mile, and I said, I got to sit down. And sat there, lost it again. The decision has been made to pull Mikey from this stage. It's just not safe for her. So I said, you know, I'm just not gonna do it. I don't have it. So we waited an hour and a half. I slept, I vomited, I <laughs> drank the hot Coke a little bit, and then, you know, got picked up, and, and that was my Tuesday. <laughs> Is that a person? Oh, shit. I had no recollection of where I was or what I was doing or anything. At one point, I was having double vision, but it's almost like somebody was like closing the blinds or like turning off the lights. Then it got to the point where I thought I was gonna potentially like lose consciousness and it just felt like every movement I was making was taking all of my energy I couldn't get cool enough I was burning up I could not have taken one more step and I didn't want to be there anymore I was in hell why am I here why did I do this to myself why why do I continually punish myself why did Jen get sick why did Jen die where, where's the macho man now? Why'd you go on? My life is harder than this. My day to day, my week to week is harder than this. This isn't hard. I do this year after year because no matter how bad it is, no matter how much suffering there is, I see these other people here and I see the different walks of life that they're from and the fact that they're like challenging themselves. Some people have it better than other people. Some people are just doing it for the fun of it, just doing it for an adventure, which are great things. I'm not doing it for those reasons. Like there's, there's things that I do on the day to day that I don't wanna do. I don't wanna be in the situation that I'm in. It just broke me down and broke me bare, broke me open. In that darkest moment, this inner voice came to me. And I just thought of my children and I thought of our home and I thought of all the things that we had built together that, that couldn't be taken away by life or death. I may have lost someone, someone very special to me, the most important person in my life, but I still had two amazing, beautiful kids at home that were waiting for me. And at that point, I wasn't just doing it for myself, I was doing it for them. Janet told me, you have to keep on keeping on. Like, what you're doing now, whatever makes you happy now, if you like running now, whatever you can do to keep yourself going, you got to keep doing those things. The balls on my feet are just wasted at this point. It started to get a little bit scary. Every step was like stepping on Legos. That's just what it felt like every time I put my foot down. I'm really getting frustrated. The minute you start thinking about quitting, boy, those thoughts just get bigger and bigger and bigger in your head. And so I start thinking, maybe I'm not gonna make it. I just didn't have it in me.
So I know that I'm way behind. I also know though that I have to finish. About a mile before the end, I made the decision to pull the flag out. That's where the energy comes from. Then I stopped and I looked down and could see blood coming through my shoes. So I immediately went over to medical and they helped me take my shoes off and cut my socks off and found that on my left foot, um, there was no skin left on the pad that had all come off. There's two layers of, of skin basically that, have, that are completely gone on, on now on both feet. You're gonna have to take off a lot of that loose skin. Feet is one of the biggest problems that people have out there. They don't realize how the heat is going to affect their, their feet. They know that they've put it this many miles in before, but they haven't done it in the kind of heat that, that we're putting them in. From here to here on your foot. Yeah. And here to here. Yep. Your skin is not in contact with the layer below. Okay, I figured that. And you got a few gaping holes with it. Yeah. It still might hurt a lot because it's, yeah. you know, an area this yeah. big. Yeah. yeah, it hurt a lot today while I was the last 10 miles. So. Putting on a race where people have feet problems, it just slows them down. And I have seen blisters like you wouldn't believe. You could barely see their feet beyond the blisters. We have a medical crew that takes care of it for them, and, and that's great, but blisters is still an issue out there. And I've had so many people that say, I have never had a blister in my life until now. And he's a badass for how far he ran on these. And I have a feeling he's gonna be a badass tomorrow because I think he's gonna run on them. Why, why, again. Why, wait, is there a choice? That's something. Well, <laughs> there's always a choice. Day three is the sprint stage. It's nine miles, and the runners find themselves running along the Colorado River. It's this whole head game with a stage race that sets itself apart from just a regular ultra, because this is like a, an ultra on steroids. I think one of the unique aspects of this stage race is that you can drop from a day, but your race isn't over. You drop, and so you know that you're not going to be a finisher, really. You can still go out every single day and face whatever challenge that day brings. You know exactly what route you're going to do, you've planned it exactly, and then everything goes to shit. And that's what makes it super fun, because you have to figure it out on the go. That's it. I'm just tired of eating dirt. I'm tired of eating dirt. I always love inspiring people to do big things. I wrestled in college. I wrestled at Ohio State. I wrestled some international after that. And then I got into mixed martial arts. When you're in, in practice and pushing it every day and getting hit and knocked down and have to get back up every time, and you see positive things come out of that, that's where you learn it. Back in 1996, I did uh, the Eco Challenge. It was 10 days out in the backcountry. We had whitewater rafting, horseback riding, running, canoeing, going over glaciers. And, and it was tough. It was really difficult. You look at me, I'm not built like a runner. I don't have long legs. I don't have, I have asthma. I don't have great lungs. There was just this slow decline as the days went on. And the one thing that I learned there is that everybody reaches a low point at some point. And I remember when I reached that low point and I had to give my pack over to my teammates to carry, and I was, I was humbled. That was not a good feeling. I like to think of, you know, there's the Rocky uh, montages where it's, it's a 30 second clip of him, him doing all these exercises and it's fun and it's exciting. That's not how the real world is. It's just hours and hours and hours of grind. And then when that grind stops, that's the big payoff. 
I had heard about the Marathon de Saab and I had heard about some other stage races and I was inspired. I wanted to do them. I wanted to, to be a part of it. And it was out of my price range. Like, okay, well, how can, I, how can I be part of this? I could create this. I think that a lot of people never reach that low point and they never experience the high that comes as a result of that. I want to provide people that opportunity. It's not about making people suffer. It's about providing them the opportunity to see what happens when they get through it. Day four is the expedition stage and it's 43 miles. It goes from the hot desert through a torturous climb, goes all the way up into the LaSalle Mountains. There's just this energy around camp and there's this underlying anxiety that we don't know what we're gonna face today. You know, you're leaving at six or seven in the morning and you're gonna hit camp at 10 or 11 at night and nobody does that. No one goes out running and says, I'll see you at midnight tonight. It's the longest day. Now I'm tired, I'm hot, I'm dirty, and my feet are hurt. This stage is terrifying. 8,000 feet of vertical gain just seems insane with the way that my legs feel right now. I think they go from being a group of strangers to being friends, and then on this day, the bond clicks and their family facing this monumental challenge and they're gonna get each other through it. They will have each other's back and that is why they're here. It's really all about the expedition. Day four, it's got the most mileage, it's got the most elevation gain, usually hot around the bottom. It could get cold up around the top. They could see some weather. They're calling for some storms. At this point, you know, I think I described it as Legos before. Now it's a little bit more like glass. My head exploded from heat on Tuesday, and I'm like, oh, it good pumps. <laughs> How good is life? It's going to start raining. It's religious, man. The thing about Mikey is people don't know, like, how incredibly tough she is. Uh, you know, I think the thing that illustrates it to me the most is she left journalism and she'd become a state trooper. She was a single mom. I was helping her move and I just thought I couldn't, I couldn't do this. It's too hard. And she's just the toughest person I know. She's been through so much and she's been mistreated by so many people. Her job is really hard. Being a police officer is it's dangerous, it's stressful. I'm in law enforcement. I'm currently assigned to the FBI task force where I investigate crimes against children and human trafficking. She loves serving, she loves helping people, but um, it's lonely as a woman and it's isolating and the things you see change you, you know? And I think for her, this is a chance to be who she is in her heart. You know, she doesn't have to be tough. She doesn't have to, you know, save anybody's life or give anybody good, you know, it's just, she's silly and, and she honestly could have been a stand-up comedian. She's very funny. Raindrops keep falling on my head. And just like the man who's seen are too big for the best. I get to joke, I get to laugh, you get to have some fun. I get to, you know, not, not be so serious, maybe, you know. Yeah, I, I get to, to you know, tease my sister. Because you have to have Coke in a bottle. 14. Coke in a bottle. Uh, that's a 17. No, you what? Yes, you do. It's kind of crazy. You, you ladies like an inch of Mm. You want to nurse? I got some in my mouth. Oh. <laughs> you want to choke me again? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I can yeah. do this half. What I would give for some hot water now, right? What are you? Come on. She said, this is our sister trip. This is our sister time. We don't, we don't feel like we get enough. Out here it's, you know, I, I just get to beat. That was a lot of up. And my back is chafing like a mofo right now. As you get older, time kind of moves so quickly 
When you're a little kid, time seems to move so slow. It relates to new experiences and like living in the moment. So because everything is new and everything is fun um, when you're young and everything's like a growing experience, uh, you remember it better. And so it solidifies in your mind because it's new and it's fresh. But as you get older, you just kind of start repeating the same shit over and over and over again. And you don't really remember it anymore. And so it all just kind of melds together. So having new experiences and doing new things is a way to like bring out that childlike experience where you're learning again and everything is fresh and you experience time better, like it expands, like you actually live as opposed to just going through the motions. Jason's just left Onion Creek at three. Still going? I'm surprised he's still going. I think he's got the toughness to suffer and he'll just keep going. He, he kept going with his feet getting that way in the first place, so I think he'll just keep going through it. Crossing the finish line on stage four is the moment that everything turns and you start to believe. And you believe you're capable of big things. You realize the why and why you're out here. Anything from Jason? He, so you heard about his cutoff. He made it into the 3 p.m. cutoff at 2.54, and then went out again and is on his way, and it's gonna be tough. Jason's moving slowly. He's out there somewhere. We heard he did a half mile in about 45 minutes. Everybody gets stripped down bare. That's where the change happens. When you get beaten down, those little things show their face. This has been like a huge swing from the hottest temperatures on Tuesday to why do I do this kind of stuff. It was the sand to the face and my legs. It felt like needles and I was like, I can't do this. It was cold. It was really cold and I did not feel warm ever. Then we kind of just tried to shield ourselves from the wind. That wind was so cold and we were so wet. I never dried out. Jason is suffering. He's in the car. He's going to wait right there. He handed the flag to Amy. So I uh, made it about, uh, I don't know, 28 miles on stage four, and uh, my feet just wouldn't hold me up anymore. So, so I had to drop out. <laughs> and, you know, you only learn from <laughs> when you do hard stuff where there's a chance of failure, but man, I didn't want to. I wanted to find a way to just keep going, but I would have fallen over. <laughs> and I got to go home to my family at some point. I didn't know where Amy was, and then as we were driving, they mentioned that Amy was going to get in around this time. As we were coming down the mountain, I passed her, and I told her I was sorry. <laughs> but she took the flag, and Mikey, her sister, and Ula are going to come across with it and I'm just grateful for those friends and I'm going to try to hobble across the finish line with them.
Unfortunately, I only made it 28 miles, and I couldn't go any farther. And so I got into the vehicle, and I was just devastated. I mean, here in my mind at this moment, I'm a failure. I didn't do what I said I was going to do. And yet all of these people came out, and they were concerned and loved me in spite of that. And it was amazing, just the outpouring of love and kindness for really people I'd only known for a few days. You know, here I'd spent all this time praying for a miracle that my feet would get better when the miracle was right there at the finish line. For me, before this race, I would have said that success was, was finishing, crossing the finish line in the allotted time. But then I got to the finish line and I realized that's not, that's not what, what success is. It's not, you know, no, I didn't cross the finish line, but I finished. I did everything I could. I left nothing out. There is literally pieces of me on this course. <laughs> It's the final day, last stage, marathon, and then it's over. Well, and I just uh, want you guys to know how much I, I love and appreciate all your help and support. For me personally, you know, as a veteran, it's really easy to feel like you're all by yourself, like nobody cares, nobody understands. And when you have these type of shared experiences and we all get to kind of experience the same it's the same amount of suck. You know, you realize you're not alone. I carry the flag because it's estimated 22 veterans a day commit suicide because they feel alone. If you know a veteran, please reach out to them. Just let them know that you see them. Obviously, I can't carry the flag today. I'm not running today. As much as I would love to, I just can't do it. I just want you guys to know I have a lot of love and respect for this group and for really for runners. I mean, it's amazing to, the, the camaraderie that you feel uh, is when you get with this with this group. And it's not that different than some of the camaraderie I have with fellow veterans. I don't know if sometimes in life we give ourselves enough credit, but I've seen a lot of people from all different walks of life, you know, teachers, contractors, lawyers, executives, moms, dads, do some pretty phenomenal stuff, you know? And we were doing it for ourselves, but we were all doing it together, and I think that's a pretty special thing. Good job. 22. Good on you, man, you are moving. It's feeling great. It's exciting to see the runners come in, cheer for them. So it's been awesome. I'm, I'm loving it. And the weather, is just I don't think it could be any better. It was great to, to cheer them on and to see them and, and have them say, hey, how are you doing? And, you know, and, and tell them I was doing great. Sometimes the best place to be is not focused on yourself, but on, on the people around you. And so everybody has this incredible shared experience. And then to, to add to that, you care about these people. You want to know how are they doing? How'd they do? Did they accomplish what they wanted to? I'm just grateful for that, you know, for that friendship, that instant friendship. I realize how much I doubt myself. Like, I'm just like an amateur athlete. I can't come out and win this thing. I'm just trying my best out here. And like coming down that road, I was like, I've like freaking doubted myself this whole time. That like hit me pretty hard. You know, like I gotta believe in myself and my training and like everything that I'm doing out here. And like the self doubt and all that will just sabotage you as like a human being. Like how often do we go out there and just sabotage ourselves because we don't believe that we're good enough or fast enough or strong enough or smart enough to do X, Y, Z. It's just all about giving your best, man. Everybody out here is giving it everything, you know? 
That's what it's all about. pretty powerful deal. I can't even wrap my head around it, man. You know, maybe I can inspire somebody else to get out there and believe in, the, in themselves and do something that's crazy, that seems like larger than life, and pour some life into some other people along the way, because that's what it's all about, you know? Um, just what a beautiful experience, man. Everybody laid it all out there. Ultimately wanted to do this race to like destroy myself and break myself down and I did exactly that but I came out on the other side like with these wonderful friendships there's so many people in life where like something really horrible and really devastating happens they let that just define the whole rest of their lives like that's just what they are I feel like when you learn to like push yourself through hard struggles you realize that that one thing doesn't define you I don't want to be a widower my whole life I don't want to be a single parent my whole life Maybe for this window right now, I'm an ultra runner and I take these crazy adventures and I'm hoping it can get me to like the next chapter. I think I'm, I think I'm getting there. That's the beauty of this Desert Rats race. We all had different experiences. We were all dealt different things. And yet we all got ourselves from Fruta, Colorado to Moab, Utah on our own two feet. I think that's a pretty amazing thing. <laughs> yay, yay. We're done. We're done. We're done. It's kind of really sad, isn't it? I know, it's kind of sad. It's kind of happy. Like, yeah. 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 We're milking this for every minute. Yeah, they gave us eight hours, we're gonna take it. All of it. It is a tremendous experience when I don't get to see her as often as I want. It's just we get to be friends for a whole week. It was a week of us with no kids and no husbands, nobody, no phones. Every minute here with her is like just a gift and I'm just, I know how lucky I am. Woo! Initially I thought the common thread was people who have had life traumas and big experiences and things that they need to work through. Things that they need to get hundreds of miles away from civilization in the middle of the desert night and day to try to address. I believed that. And then I realized that that's the human condition. We all have that. And maybe the people that do desert rats are the people who know it, who want to explore their human condition and who want to work through some of that and move towards enlightenment or whatever happens after a week where you transform yourself and you learn more about yourself and you learn more about being a human. I think these people want more and they want to get through their story and see what comes next.